Hey there, uh, my name is Hillary Lambert. I'm executive director of the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network. And with me helping me here tonight is Jen Tufano, our program's staff. And we have two speakers for you tonight. Um, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that we haven't seen a lot of you before. This is very exciting. We may have almost 200 people um, listening in tonight, which tells us that this is a, a very uh, uh, important topic. Uh, lake levels, the lake levels situation in Cayuga Lake and um, what you'll hear about tonight is, is how the Finger Lakes uh, work hydrologically. And uh, then uh, commentary about um, climate change and trends that may make things not quite as um, comfortable and stable as they used to be, which is what, what a lot of people experienced this summer, especially on Cuga Lake. Um, so we're the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. We've been around about 24 years at this point, um, helping educate and network. Uh, people around Cayuga Lake and in the last few years working with our partner groups across the region. And um, when we saw this summer all of the um, flooding and trouble that people were having because of, of uh, rain in unusual times at unusual amounts, we thought uh, boy it would be great to be able to uh, communicate with everybody and fortunately um, um, Bill Capel, uh, USGS hydrogeologist who about 12 years ago went around the lake, actually in person from library to library, giving a presentation about lake levels, how Cuga Lakes levels work, etc. cetera. Um, he popped up and said, hey, I think it's time for people to hear this again. So, um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, Bill is going to give you a presentation, the ups and downs of Cuga Lake, and that'll be followed. Uh, please, if you've got questions, load them up into the chat at the bottom of your screen, and we will have about 10 minutes in the, at the end of Bill's presentation um, to, to have Bill answer them. And then we'll hear from uh, David Wolf. Uh, with some perspective uh, about present and future uh, that uh, on Bill's presentation. Okay, Bill, um, take it away. Very good. Okay, for those of you who may have been around 10, 15 or so years ago. This will look familiar, but it is updated to current situations. Basically, I'll be talking about water level changes in Cuga Lake, or how I learned to stop worrying and accept the changes in Cuga Lake water levels with apologies to Dr. Strangelove. Uh, there are four of us uh, originally who put this program together. Uh, Dr. Craig Williams at the time was the New York State uh, historian. He has retired. Mike Riley, who lives in Cayuga County, has written a book about the Erie Canal in, C in Cayuga County. Bill Hecht, who is a local history and photography archivist. And then myself, uh, I retired from the survey probably, I don't know, five or so years ago, but still work with them as an emeritus. I'm going to start with basically, this is the uh, Oswego River Basin. It extends from Canandaigua Lake to the west, all the way over to Oneida Lake to the east with the central and eastern Finger Lakes within. The area outlined in white is about 5,100 square miles, about the same size as the state of Connecticut. So imagine trying to regulate the flows in the state of Connecticut. This is what we're dealing with uh, in the Oswego River Basin. From that point, if we look at topography, uh, the Appalachian Plateau is basically the uplands that exist around uh, the Finger Lakes. 
The 1,000 and 2,000 foot contours are shown in black and red. You'll note that many of the Finger Lakes are incised into the 1,000 foot contour. Before glaciation, it would have been a smoother line, but the glaciers basically took advantage of rivers that used to flow to the south and widened and deepened them. And interestingly enough, Seneca and Cayuga Lake are the lowest of the Finger Lakes as far as uh, the uh, surface elevation of the lake. They're the longest and they're the farthest to the south. That's because uh, the bedrock in our area has a, uh, a significant change and there's a dip where Seneca and Cayuga Lake are located. And this is one of the reasons why we have a flooding problem. The other aspect is the 500 foot contour basically extends along the Clyde River, which is now the, the Barge Canal, and all the way through Oneida Lake with an outlet going to uh, Lake Ontario. So we have the Clyde River, the Seneca River, the Oneida River coming in from the east at Three Rivers Junction at Phoenix. It then becomes the Oswego River. This is pretty much a cartoon. Uh, I say it's a cartoon because if you note on the y-axis on the left, the, uh, the hatchers are 25 feet, where if you look at the x-axis along the bottom, each hatcher is 10 miles. If it was to be put to scale, there would just be a lot small black line in the middle. But what I'm trying to show here is, is that what you have is you have the surface elevations of each of the Finger Lakes, you have the percentage of the watershed, of the entire watershed related to each one of these. And then you have the barge canal. And you'll note that between Cayuga Lake and all the way over to Baldwinsville, it's flat. It's about 30 miles. And even before the barge canal was put in, it was very flat and I'll get into that. And then you can see we're at the Three Rivers Junction, there is a very steep, uh, reduction in land surface elevation down to Lake Ontario, as it is for most of the Finger Lakes, except for Cayuga Lake. So what we have is we have Cuca Lake. It drains to Seneca Lake, and Seneca Lake drains to the very northern end of Cayuga Lake. So not only do we have the flows coming in from these two Finger Lakes into Cayuga Lake, but we also have the watershed itself. And the watershed itself is fairly simple. We have the inlet channel, number one to the bottom, Six Mile Creek, Fall Creek, which has a very extensive watershed, very unusual for the Finger Lakes. And then we have the Salmon River, which drains north to south. And then we have the more typical uplands to the lake type of uh, streams. We have Taganic, we have Sheldrake Creek, Paines, and Yogurt. And right at the mouth, not including Seneca and Cuca Lake, the watershed area is about 785 square miles. But if you add in Cuca and Seneca, it doubles the watershed size of Cuyuga Lake. And one of the interesting aspects is, as far as the Cuga Lake watershed to the water surface area, there's a ratio of 12 to one, which means that if you have one inch of runoff coming from the entire basin flowing to Cuyuga Lake, that's one foot of water added to Cuyuga Lake. That's why we see such rapid rises in the water level of Cuga Lake where we have these large rainstorms. Okay, uh, this is not a stock report. I'm gonna to try to explain this to you. This is from 2009. And the bottom line here, the blue line, is the water level of the Seneca River below the mudlock structure which controls the water level of Cuga Lake. The rather straight lines here are what's called the rule curve. Each of the Finger Lakes has a rule curve. The rule curve is a approximation of where the water level in each lake should be at particular times of the year. These were uh, put together, I believe in the 1960s 
uh, uh, under a study that was done by the Army Corps of Engineers, and I think it was American International that actually did the work for the Corps. So each of the finger lakes has these rule curves. Now, the red line is the water elevation of Cayuga Lake during 2009. And you can see for the most part that they stayed very close to the, to the rule curve itself. Above, we have the different flood levels, minor, major, and 100, 100 year. If you look over to the left side, these do not correspond to the water levels that are broadcast, uh, recorded by the USGS, nor broadcast by the National Weather Service. Uh, the Barge Canal has its own datum. It's still the same water level elevation, but because of a datum difference, the water levels between the Barge Canal datum and USGS National Weather Service datum is about one and a half feet. Okay, and also at the top, we have rainfall. Uh, this is rainfall recorded at the mudlock structure itself. This is not the all-encompassing rainfall for the entire Cuyahoga Lake watershed, but it gives an idea of what's going on. Now, to the present day, we can see, again, we see water level fluctuations below the mudlock structure. And interestingly enough, we don't see it uh, into uh, September, October, and November. There are large spikes in the water levels of the Seneca River down through the mudlock, and you don't see much of a change in the Cuyahoga Lake water level. Again, until we get into late summer, where we started getting tremendous amounts of rainfall. And so what we see is during the late October, early November uh, storms, we have the increase from minor to major, almost major flood levels. And we can see that the Seneca River downstream of the mudlock structure is only two feet lower than the water level in Cayuga Lake. This is very critical in how much water can be released from the lake to the Seneca River. This is a long-term hydrograph going from about the mid 1950s to present day. And we have the action stage 383, which is basically, it's not a flood yet, but be aware. Then we have 383.5, which is minor flood level. Then we have moderate flood level at 384 major flood level at 385. And then we have the 100 year flood level, which is about 387.2. Of interest, you can look across the hydrograph. And for those of you who lived in the watershed back during Hurricane Agnes, we had almost the 100 year flood level in Cayuga Lake. Then we've had smaller storms, which have gone above the moderate flood level, some approaching the major flood level. And then we get to 1993. 1993 was a really bad winter, unlike what we have present day. It was some of the heaviest snowfall recorded in not only the Cuga Lake Basin, but in the region. And we had a tremendous amount of runoff and we had rain on top of snow, which basically caused us almost again to get to the 100 year flood level. And then we had more of these intermediate type of storms. And then in 2011, we were basically where we're at in late October, early November. So you can see that there are these excursions that do go from minor to moderate to in some cases, major flood level. So it's not that unusual, although we're seeing more and more of these spikes as we get from about the 1960s to present day. Uh, I could go into tree rings and things like that, but I won't at this particular point, but the, the, the amount of fluctuations in water levels and more and more of these flood situations are typical. And uh, David Wolf will talk about climate change. The climate's always changed, but basically we are seeing greater variability now. And that greater variability began in about the 1960s and is extending through the present day. Okay, here's some of the news reports. 
from late October, early November for Canandaigua Lake. They saw the water level rise just shy of official flood stage for Canandaigua Lake. Other Finger Lakes to the west, Honeyoy and, and Owasco to the east, basically were not as severely affected, indicating that the rainfalls that was seen across the region was not consistent. It seemed to be in certain areas. At Cuca Lake, heavy rains over the past week caused lake levels, water levels in the several Finger Lakes to rise more than a foot in a matter of hours, wrecking docks, and basically causing a lot of damage in the different lakes. Seneca Lake, last week rains an extraordinary flow from Cuca Outlet. This is one of the things that we have to deal with. All of the Finger Lakes need to work together. It's not that, you know, Cuca Lake decided we're just gonna let, let everything go out of the outlet and we're not gonna have a flood. They regulated the flow, but it was a lot of water that flowed from Cuca into Seneca. And that, plus the rainfall in the Seneca watershed, basically brought the uh, water level up from 446 to almost 448 in the space of about a week. Next, we have Cayuga Lake. It rose more than a foot and a half in 16 hours. Again, uh, what I talked about earlier, the 12 to 1 ratio, we had saturated ground. The water could not infiltrate fast enough, so it ran off, and it very quickly changed the water level of Cayuga Lake. And the uh, basically, uh, you can read through the rest of this, easily passing flood stage, and then by the morning, it was almost at the major flood level, as most of you know. And then we get the Cross Lake, which is located downstream on the Seneca River. And the residents there were furious because their water level in Cross Lake, which is part of the Seneca River, rose by nine feet. So here again, it wasn't just Cayuga Lake. It wasn't just Seneca Lake. It was a number of the Finger Lakes and the Seneca River, which flowed to the east to Baldwinsville and then to the Three Rivers Junction. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of Greek names for towns and cities in the area, but there's no Olympus. But the quote for Olympus, uh, basically from the Odyssey, where they say the God's eternal mansion stands unmoved, never rocked by gale winds, never drenched by rains, nor do the drifting snows assail it. No, the clean air stretches away without a cloud and a great radiance plays across the world where the blithe gods live all their days in bliss. Number one, none of us are gods. Number two, there's no Olympus. And number three, this describes a static environment. This is wonderful for people who live along streams and rivers and who live along the lakes. They love to see the lake or river just do what it does calmly and so they can enjoy it. But unfortunately, we live in a dynamic environment and it's becoming more dynamic because of climate change. So there's no Olympus. So we have to deal with these dramatic changes in water levels to low water levels during the drought to very high levels during heavy rainstorms or snowmelt runoff. As a historical perspective, the blue line that I show here is the original Erie Canal that was built in the 18 teens. It was not in the rivers. It basically went from Lyons to Clyde to Montezuma, which is on the east side of the Seneca River, to Jordan, which is a very critical point in this area. It's called the summit level. Basically, way back then, water from Skinny Atlas Lake was fed into the Barge Canal, and the water flowed either to the east for lockages, or it flowed to the west back toward Cayuga Lake. From Jordan to Syracuse, and I'll be talking later about Baldwinsville, which is up along the Seneca River, and this is Cross Lake right here. As we come closer in to the northern end of Cayuga Lake, again, this is from 1839. This is the Seneca Cayuga Canal. It was not in the river. It was a canal that was built adjacent to the river and it locked into the Seneca River. And to the east, there was actually a canal that went from the village of Cayuga 
north up to Montezuma where it joined the Erie Canal. Now, the reason for that was way back in the 1800s, this, and it still is a very shallow area and there was no machinery to basically dig a channel from Hugo Lake to the Seneca River. So therefore, basically they had to create a canal to get supplies in and out of, of Hugo Lake up to the canal. And again, this water was coming from Jordan and it was a lockage that basically flowed to the south into Cayuga Lake. Now, interesting enough, there used to be a bridge along the northern part of Cayuga Lake. It was a mile long. These are different uh, etchings and so forth of this bridge. At, on the Cayuga uh, County side, it basically describes a mile long bridge carried a stream of Western migration and there was a jail underneath the Eastern side. This is an aerial photo. And these are the rock cribs that were basically all the way across the lake that supported this bridge that existed for almost 50 years. And after uh, they didn't rebuild the bridge, they had ferries that took people across. In fact, during the uh, earlier depression in the 30s depression, there was talk of actually building a concrete bridge, but it never came to fruition. All right, so again, what we have is we have the Seneca Cayuga Canal, we have the Cayuga Canal, and then we have the Erie Canal to the north. At the junction, we have the water level that was coming from Seneca Lake was about 386.4 on average. The water level in the Seneca River, rivers flowing to the north, was 380.4. And the water level in the Cayuga Canal was 10 feet higher. So lockages were moving across the river and then being locked up into the Cayuga Canal further to the north. And this is what it looked like. This was the Cayuga Canal, or excuse me, the Seneca Canal coming from Seneca Lake. The Seneca River was flowing back in over to the, to the left. This is the beginning of the Seneca River. This is the lock at Mudlock. And there was actually a bridge that went across the opening of the Seneca River. There was a bulwark here because as the canal boats came across, they were being towed by mules and so forth. And so they needed the bridge, but they didn't want the, the barge canal barges to basically crash into the bridge. But this is what it looked like a long time ago. And today, if you look from above, you can still see the stone areas that were supported that bridge that went across. This is the mudlock structure up here. And you can see the guard gate for the mudlock structure, the lock that goes from Cuga Lake down to the Seneca River. In the mid 1800s, the, the original canal was so uh, successful they basically made all the money that they invested in the original canal and just decided to rebuild the canal, make it wider, make it deeper, and also make it more efficient. So when they built the second canal, instead of being in the swamp, the Montezuma Swamp, they basically stayed on Caruso Island and then built an earth embankment all the way across to the Seneca River. And then they created the Richmond Aqueduct, a beautiful stone arch structure that took the canal across and up into Montezuma with no need for a lockage. And this stone arch bridge, then here's you know, an etching of it. This is a picture of what this thing looked like. It's absolutely beautiful. I love stonework, I'm a geologist. And it was a 32 arch aqueduct that carried the barge canal across the Seneca River. Unfortunately, in the early 1900s, they then put the barge canal into as many rivers as possible. So the old structure that went all the way across the Seneca River, they basically removed it. If you look closely, there's like a boxish type area here. This was the box that held the water that allowed the canal boats to go across the aqueduct. And this was the towpath here. 
This is a picture as they began to tear down the old Richmond Aqueduct, removing the box. And then once they got finished, they basically blasted and removed a lot of the piers that were in the Seneca River. But they still left the earth embankment further to the west. Uh, this is the village of Montezuma further to the north, uh, excuse me, to the east. This is the throughway. This is Route 31. And this is where the canal and the aqueduct went across the Seneca River. Today, you can still view the stone arches. They are uh, maintained by a group of dedicated people to try to keep the weeds from in infecting and basically causing the arches and the stonework to deteriorate. But these still exist today. So these are 150 year old and they're still standing. Okay, if you look at the base of this illustration here, this is the old canal dug into the wetlands there. The new canal was built above it. It was enlarged, it was deeper, and it was wider to handle more barge canal traffic. But at the same time, railroads and roads were being built, and the barge canal was basically, even after the 19, uh, excuse me, 1850s reconstruction, we're starting to see a loss of business. This is what's called a shaded relief map. It's a topographic map that's computer generated. We see the different lakes, Cayuga, Owasco, Skinny Atlas, and so on. But notice right up here, this is the earth embankment that comes off of Caruso Island and it virtually blocks flow that used to go through the wetlands and then go downstream to the east. And this embankment is still there. So it, it basically causes all water that comes out of, of Cuga Lake past the mudlock structure, as well as water that's coming from Canandaigua Lake from the west. It all has to go through that opening for the Seneca River. So today, what we have is we have five and 20. This would have been the old route uh, 20 here. We have the throughway, and then we have the new barge canal. Interestingly enough, from the state records, each year the barge, the Erie Canal, had to report to both the state assembly and the state senate about the ongoing activities to improve the, the canal system. In 1852, the fall of the Seneca River from the Rochester Syracuse Railroad Bridge, that's the existing uh, viaduct that goes, railroad viaduct that goes across the northern end of Cuga Lake now to the Baldwinsville Dam, again, about 31 miles downstream. The fall was 12 and a half feet, over 30 miles. That's less than a half foot per mile. So even without the reconstruction of the canal into the river, it was a very, very flat section. And to get water to move along that flat, flat section is very difficult. In the 1853 report to the Senate, uh, the lowering of the Seneca River at the foot of Cuga Lake, basically uh, the Montezuma uh, wetlands, is proposed as the river at Jack's Reef is to be lowered by three feet. By the way, references to reefs are basically bedrock highs where either the river or the canal tried to work its way through. Bars, sandbars, not drinking bars, were removed at the foot of Cuga Lake, Martins Rapids, about two miles further downstream and at Mosquito Point, basically where the Wasco River comes into the Seneca River. Many adjustments were made in the 1830s to further lower the marshes at Montezuma and at Ithaca at this point have been ineffectual. Very difficult to basically dig out these areas. The 1831 report indicates spring floods are not relieved until June and July, after which the water in Cuga Lake continues to rise due to weed growth in the Seneca River channels. Again, they were very shallow and the weeds came in and basically blocked the flow. Water in Cuga Lake is higher in September and October than in April. Emphasize it, water in Cuga Lake is higher in September and October than in April under natural conditions. So flooding is not as unusual as people think. More statements. 
1855, after the second uh, generation of the canal was in place, the effect of the Richmond Aqueduct, marshes at Montezuma are overflowed, large quantities of water passing over the marsh, uh, embankment for the canal, dam the wetland and force all the water through the Seneca River, causing injury to the lands all the way. Again, the construction of that embankment impeded flow that would naturally would have flowed through those wetlands. Now, the next statement is gonna sound very familiar, but realize that this was 150 years ago. As the country is cleared up and the swamplands drained and subject, subjected to cultivation, the time required for heavy rains to find their way to the stream and lake is much shortened. When in former time, the lowlands held back and distributed slowly their contents for weeks, in a few hours now suffice to precipitate the falling water into their natural avenues of escape. Something must be done to prevent this flooding. The flooding that we see was occurring 150 years ago. Assembly of the State of New York, 1860, blockages downward from Buffalo to Montezuma and from Jordan to Montezuma create additional flows to the Seneca River. And by the way, Mosquito Point Reef has not been removed to this point. Again, they were having difficulty in lowering the water level of the Seneca River. From 1860 report, the cut at Jack's Reef was completed in 1857. They didn't remove the bedrock in the natural channel. They actually cut out a meander and they cut it through solid bedrock. So if you're traveling from Cross Lake East toward Baldwinsville, you go through this bedrock cut. This is the cut they're talking about. And when they did that, they lowered the water level at Cross Lake by four feet. Sandbars were removed at Hickory Point, Mosquito Point, and so on. Basically, and they still had to enlarge cuts in other shoals, fans, and bedrock uh, interferences in the canal itself. 1885, these observations indicate improvements already made, reduced the water level stage at Cuyah Lake by one foot, Richmond Aqueduct by two, and Mosquito Point by four. Very slowly, they were working their way up further and further toward the Montezuma wetlands. Eventually, by the late, uh, late 1800s into the early 1900s, they had successfully started lowering the water level in the, in the Montezuma marshes. 1907, when they did the last reconstruction, moving the Barge Canal into rivers, uh, the amendment for the reconstruction of the Cuyuga Seneca Canal in connection to the new canal, moving the main canal alignment by five <laughs> south to Cuyuga Lake due to, in quotes, massive quantities of cement gypsum and especially salt required a direct link between Cuyuga Lake and the main barge canal. This is politics at its work back in the early 1900s. Construction of the mudlock structure in 1950 was the first structure across the outlet of Cuga Lake, and it did not change the water level of Cuga Lake. There have been folks that have pointed out that there used to be wetlands in Ithaca, and they felt that the reconstruction and the uh, construction of the mudlock structure basically drowned out those wetlands. It's not the case. The case is that basically the golf course at Stewart Park is landfill. That's where those wetlands used to be. And then where all the big box stores are along Route 13, that used to be wetlands. And those were all filled. One of the things that uh, we tried to show people was that the water level of Cuba Lake has not changed due to the mudlock structure. In the historical information, back in 1851, there were measurements between the locks and the water level in the lake. So lock 10 at Cuyuga and lock nine at mudlock, they're roughly the same elevation. There's a little bit of a difference, maybe survey error or something like that. Another survey was done in 1884. And again, you're seeing similar elevations between the two points. And it turned out in 2009, I believe Bill Hecht uh, 
found out that somebody was building a new house in Cayuga. And as they were clearing the land, they actually found the old lock structure for the Cayuga lock. So what we did was we went up there with survey equipment and in 2009, we measured at Mudlock and we measured at Cayuga. And basically it is still the same rough water level, obviously differences for time of the year and so on. But basically the Mudlock structure did not change the water level elevation of Cayuga Lake in of itself. So here we have today, again, routes in five and 20, the bridge across the lake no longer exists. The New York Thruway goes through here and the present day barge canal goes basically from, they did dredge the uh, area between uh, the northern end of the lake back past the railroad and even further to the south to create a channel so you could take your boats through here. They reconstructed the, the channel, connected it to the barge canal here. And you can see that over here on the right side. All right, the takeaways from this. One, Cayuga Lake is the lowest, has the lowest lake surface, surface elevation of all the Finger Lakes and its watershed extends back to Seneca and Cayuga watersheds. It's not easy to control that much area from basically three different watersheds. Cuga Lake's watershed area to lake surface area is a ratio of 12 to one. One inch of runoff can add one foot of water to the lake within one day, or that quote from November, it occurred in 16 hours. Under ideal conditions at Mudlock, if the Seneca River north of Mudlock is below the level of Cuga Lake and they open all of the gates at Mudlock, they can only lower the water level of the lake by a tenth of a foot a day. Lowering the lake for, by one foot takes approximately 10 days if it doesn't rain anymore. In 1996, people were complaining that they needed to open the floodgates at Mudlock to release water to the Seneca River. The Barge Canal people did not do that because the Seneca River was physically higher than the water level in Cayuga Lake. If they would have opened the floodgates, water would have flowed into Cayuga Lake. They had to wait till the water level dropped low enough to begin the discharge to the Seneca River. So if the Seneca River is up, it, the lowering of the lake may take longer just because of the inefficiency of the drop of water level between the lake and what's in the Seneca River. What was said 150 years ago about routing water too quickly to the lake is just as true today. We have highway departments who dig their ditches along the roadways. You have farmers who basically tile drain their fields. You have tremendous parking lots that prohibit the infiltration of water. I'm not saying all this is bad, except for the fact that it routes water more quickly to the lake. While we're experiencing climate variability, and David will talk about this very soon, the lake's system's hydraulics, its plumbing, remain the same due to topography, geology, hydrology, and the infrastructure that exists. And we really can't change that plumbing that much. And so we're going to have to live with these water level changes. The 100-year flood of several decades ago is moving toward a 90-year flood Basically, these floods are gonna start occurring more often and therefore it's gonna change the return period, what they call the return period. And again, David will talk about that. And Cayuga Lake is part of the larger Oswego River watershed. Therefore, Cayuga and all the Finger Lakes and the rivers must share the brunt of climate change and associated changes in water levels, including flooding. I've often said that if the Barge Canal is doing their job right, they're being yelled at by everybody. Either the water's too low or the water's too high. If there's one lake or a cross lake and nobody else is complaining, then they're not regulating the system correctly. But the Barge Canal is only responsible for Cuga and Seneca Lake, as well as the Barge Canal. The other lakes are controlled by lake associations, but in general, they all work together. And they can release water from these other lakes, but basically from Cuga Lake, 
it's inhibited by the geology, the topography, and the hydrology. Okay, the ups and downs of Cuga Lake, or how I learned to stop worrying and accept the changes in the Cuga Lake water levels and plan on such accordingly. We can't fix the plumbing, so therefore, we as individuals who live along the rivers and live along the lake have to basically live with this and learn how to live with it the best they can. Questions? I guess the moderators, if you have some questions. Yes. Um, Bill, that was uh, spectacular. Thank you so much. This is Hillary Lambert for the Cube Lake Watershed Network. And um, Jen, um, our program uh, person is gonna, Jen, if you could read from the chat questions and Bill could answer. Sure, so an early question that came in, um, comment and question uh, was the Cayuga Inlet data did not appear to indicate any significant increase or frequency or amplitude since the 60s in the surface level. Does Cayuga Inlet data exist before the 1960s? Yes, it does. Uh, the graph that I showed was basically for the Cayuga Inlet gauge, which is at the Boathouse Grill, boathouse grill uh, basically. Um, that record goes back into the 20s. So there is data on that. Uh, you know, there's a period of time based upon tree rings that from the late 1800s, 1880, 1890 to about 1960, the precipitation and runoff from rivers was basically it followed a very smooth sine curve. I talked with my hands, but you can't see my hands. But now we're seeing more and more of the way of perturbations to that very smooth sine curve, either low water levels or high water levels. Therefore, the period before the 1880s showed a lot more in the way of fluctuations based upon tree rings. And the periods from 1960 to today are showing a lot more perturbations than in that period from let's say 1880 to 1960. So uh, a lot of things, not only Cuga Lake, but a lot of our infrastructure for drinking water, for uh, water control was designed on that very quiescent period. And probably the 1960s to present and the 1880s previous is probably more normal than the period between 1880 and 1960. Hopefully that answered that question. Great, thanks Bill. We'll keep moving on because questions are starting to come in now pretty quickly. Uh, next one is given that so many lakes feed into the river system, why do so few lakes have dams to control their flow into the rivers? A uh, question goes on, why should not Cucas uh, and Seneca's levels be allowed to fluctuate more? And is it mostly influenced rather than scientific hydrology? Okay, first of all, most of the lakes have a control structure. Uh, Cayuca has a structure that, uh, in that one quote, said there's a tremendous amount of water coming out of Cayuga Lake. There is a control structure. Oh, I think it's either at Ann or at Dresden, I can't remember. Seneca Lake has a series of dams which are related to the canal system. And on uh, those, those dam structures, uh, D-A-M, not N, uh, there is hydropower. And so the hydropower companies somewhat control the water levels. And during uh, periods where they get high water, you know, they can generate a lot of power, but at the same time, they release water downstream. Uh, there are control structures on just about every one of the uh, lakes. The dams are basically there to hold back water so that if there's a drought, it maintains the water level of the lake as best they can or to basically they can open up their uh, structures to allow water to flow downstream, but they don't allow the water to flow freely because then they don't feel the impacts, but people who live downstream do. And so uh, in Seneca Lake, in Cuca Lake, in obviously Cayuga Lake, 
And in some of the other Finger Lakes, this October, November period, there was flooding and uh, all types of damage along the shorelines of those lakes too. It wasn't just Cayuga Lake. Uh, as far as the Seneca River, um, unfortunately, the people that live on Cross Lake, they live in a flood, flood prone area. Yes, the water level rose nine feet, but it rose to a water level elevation of 383, which is about the water level uh, it's actually lower than the water level of Cayuga Lake. If Cayuga Lake would have opened all of their uh, structures, uh, Cross Lake would have flooded even more. And then what you have at the end of this is Baldwinsville. There's a lock and a dam there. It's built on a reef, a bedrock high. That's why uh, the, the system was flooded even naturally many, many years ago. So there are, is all this infrastructure there People said, well, let's take all the dams out. You take all the dams out, you basically end up causing all types of problems that you wouldn't be able to boat in the canal or in the rivers or in the lakes. It's, there's no simple solution to this. The solution is for everybody to work together and try to deal with things as best as possible. But if you live along a river, if you live along a lake, you are in a floodplain. And unfortunately, you can expect to be flooded. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, we're gonna move on here. There was a request to please discuss the hydro plant in Waterloo and its effect on Seneca Lake water levels. Uh, yeah, I just, I just sort of went through that. There are hydro powers at Waterloo and Seneca Falls. They do, uh, they do impede the flow. Uh, how that relates to the rule curve of Seneca Lake, I am not that well versed in Seneca Lake as I am in Cuyuga Lake. I know uh, people who live on Seneca Lake do complain that the water level is being held too high and then they get a big storm and then they get a flood. Uh, this is something that needs to be worked out between the Barge Canal Corporation and the hydropower projects and uh, obviously Seneca Lake Pure Waters so that there is uh, some type of agreement as to how these hydropower projects and the structures that they are located on can be utilized in such a fashion to reduce, not eliminate, but try to reduce the amount of flooding that does occur. But when you have a big storm, the plumbing of the system will not, even in a natural condition, will not allow water levels to basically always remain low. There will be floods, unfortunately. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next question is, uh, you say to accept the flooding, but you also mentioned the earthen levee across the Montezuma wetlands. Does this contribute to the severity of flooding more than may have existed before this was built? And is it feasible to reduce the severity of flooding by modifying the ability of water to flow through Montezuma's wetlands more back to how it was before any Erie Canal construction occurred? There is a possibility to that. It would have to go through basically a modeling exercise, uh, under, basically build a mathematical model for the flow system, and then you know, mathematically remove the embankment to see if it would change things. The big thing though is that, again, from the Montezuma wetlands to Baldwinsville, the water level is basically a flat plain. And it's very difficult to get water to move when there's no high to low. So uh, the possibility of removing the embankment, I'm guessing that it would not make much of a difference because the actual control during a flood situation is going to be the canal itself. There's no, the only lock is at the downstream end, which is at Baldwinsville. Now people say, okay, let's remove the structure at Baldwinsville. Uh, there's a hydropower project there too, but uh, you then remove the ability to utilize that flat section of uh, the canal all the way back to Montezuma. Again, this is, you just, you just don't look at your backyard. You have to look upstream and you have to look downstream and what can be done along 
the entire stretch. That's where I said that, that one quote that everybody's got to work together in order to ameliorate the amount of flooding that occurs, but it's not going to go away. We can possibly reduce the amount of flooding a little bit, but when it, it rains, it pours. And when it pours, it flows quickly into the lake, but it flows very slowly out of the lake, depending upon uh, water levels between the dam and the downstream area. It depends on what's coming in from upstream, from Canandaigua Lake and all that watershed further upstream. So the, I think the, the, the answer to all this, and it probably won't keep anybody happy, would be to model the entire system to see if there's places where improvements could be made. But even with that, with climate change and we're seeing more and more heavy, heavy rainfalls, all that water has got to go someplace. And unfortunately, a lot of it is slowed down by that very flat section between Montezuma and Baldwinsville. It's about the best I can do on that one. That was great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, next question uh, comes from Frank. He asked, does Montreal Port Harbor come into play to allow more water to go into Ontario? Yes, it does. Uh, what we're seeing here is played out in the Great Lakes. What happens in Montreal is that the river has the capacity. There is a hydropower uh, dams uh, along the St. Lawrence Seaway just downstream from the outlet of Lake Ontario. And people have complained over the years about flooding along Lake Ontario, much like they've complained about flooding along the Finger Lakes. And it moves its way upstream. There's complaints about flooding in Lake Erie. There's complaints about flooding in Lake Huron. There's complaints and flooding all the way up to Lake Superior. What we've I've tried to describe here for the Finger Lakes is just as true in the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. There's a certain amount of capacity. And uh, at times when Lake Ontario was very high, people wanted, you know, let's get that lake level down. Let's just shoot it down. But there's infrastructure that exists downstream all the way through Montreal. Montreal, a lot, a lot of Montreal is built right on the river. And so if we're gonna let the river rip through Montreal, people in Montreal are not gonna be happy. But what they did was they tried to, as we're trying to do in the Finger Lakes, ameliorate to a certain degree, the amount of flooding and spread the grief over a larger area. Hopefully I've answered that question. That's great. Um, so we have lots of questions coming in, Bill. I just wanted to let everybody know that if we're not able to get, to, we're going to answer a few more questions and then we'll move on to David Wolf around eight o'clock. Whatever questions we're not able to answer um, during this time, we are going to save this chat. We will send it out to the speakers who will provide some sort of written response, which we can send out to all the participants. I am offering them up to do that. Um, I'm sure they will be willing to do so. So just don't be worried if uh, we're not able to get to your question live tonight, but we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we have available. Okay. Uh, next question, Bill, is, is there going to be a new rule curve study in the very near future? And if you could explain what that is. Yes, uh, basically the rule curves are, you know, where lake levels need to be. A, uh, a study of rule curves for each one of the Finger Lakes is a possibility. But as I think Abraham Lincoln said, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, if we change the rule curve such that we lower the lake levels, then you're going to have dock owners who are going to complain that they can't get their boats to or from their docks. People are going to complain that maybe the water level is too low and they can't utilize their lake wells. Um, then you also have uh, concerns about the ecology of the lake. Uh, you know, the water level fluctuations basically sort of help flush the lake and so on and so forth. Rule curve modifications can be proposed, but they have impacts that need to be considered also. Great, thanks. Next question, how did partial removal of the Richmond aqueduct impact water flow and or water levels along the Seneca River? 
Okay, the aqueduct was removed in the, uh, the 19 teens. They did the last reconstruction of uh, the, the barge canal system, making it much wider and deeper. The removal of the Richmond aqueduct was done because the Seneca River was now part of the canal and obviously uh, canal boats or whatever couldn't get through those archways. So they removed the archways, uh, a large part of them that were in the river. Uh, again, existing on either on the east and west side, some of the arches still exist. The person may be talking about the embankment, the, uh, the embankment that leads from Caruso Island to the aqueduct. We talked about that earlier. Uh, removal of that might have a local impact, but regionally, I don't think it would change how the water moves further downstream because then you have the barge canal in the Seneca River all the way down to Baldwinville and then down to Phoenix and then to Lake Ontario. Yeah, great. And Bill, we have a number of folks tuning in from uh, Wasco Lake, and there's a, a request about where to find additional information for Owasco Lake and what's happening there. Do you have any resource you could send? There's an Owasco Lake Watershed Association that was uh, created a number of years ago. I think uh, they would be a there would be a good place to start uh, because uh, they too have their own problems uh, with HABs with uh, you know, drinking water and with flooding. And I think uh, that particular lake association would be at least a place to start. Uh, the problems in Owasco Lake are similar to the problems that we have in all of the Finger Lakes. Okay, and the next question may be uh, better addressed by David in the next presentation, but there um, it is, might the I might the ideal lake level curves change to reflect the bigger current oscillations due to climate change? Do you want to, uh, David, Bill, I, later? Yeah, I, I think in this case, it's basically, um, you know, we are seeing those floods, but those are, you know, floods that do occur over a number of days to weeks. But then you have the rest of the year where everything is, quote, uh, more Olympus-like, calmer. And uh, if you would adjust to that, it becomes more difficult because again, you, you're limited on what you can release. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention in my presentation, a lot of this, the barge canal for Seneca and Cuga Lake, and I think for the other lake associations, look at weather reports. And weather reports are good. You know, they have the extended weather but the Weather Bureau has what's called their skill level uh, forecasts that go out about three to four days, maybe five, are fairly reliable. The closer you get to uh, the next day, the more reliable the forecast is. So if you look at Cuga Lake and uh, their forecasting, it looks like we're going to have a big storm in a week and everything is, is calm. The Barge Canal is going to open up some of their locks if the water level's too high. And they're going to try to get that water level down in anticipation of that storm. But again, they can only lower the water level a tenth of a foot a day. So if it's three to five days out, they can only lower the, the water level of the lake by three tenths to maybe a half foot. Therefore, um, the efficiency of that, again, we look at this last set of storms where they said that in the space of 16 hours, the water level of Cuga Lake went up by a foot and a half. It would ameliorate the flooding to a small degree, but it's better than nothing at all. So a lot of this is dependent upon forecasting. The closer you are to the forecast day, the better your forecast is going to be. And there's been times where the, uh, the barge canal has basically, let's lower the water level in, antici in anticipation of something, and then it doesn't rate at all. And then they get yelled at because the water level is too low, it hasn't rained, and people can't use their docks, and so on. It's not, this is not an easy bathtub where you pull the plug and watch the water disappear. It doesn't work that way. And I'm sure I'll get yelled at for that one. <laughs> um, I think we are going to uh, just do one more question, Bill, and then we're going to move on to Dave, uh, who's just going to keep the conversation going. 
Um, and the question um, I'm posing is, is there some centralized forecast driven control system for the lake slash river levels, or is it entirely reactive? Meaning rather than proactive, for example, lower lakes uh, several days before heavy rainfall events. I think uh, the, again, the Barge Canal Corporation is responsible for Seneca Cayuga. The others are lake associations. I am going to take a step out and say, I think everybody is looking at forecasts so that they can try to uh, anticipate. But again, the forecasts are only goods for so far out. But I think, I hope that people are looking at forecasts. So if there's a, looks like there's gonna be a remnant of a hurricane coming up the East Coast that may hit central New York, they're gonna open up some of those gates in conjunction with those people downstream to try to get the water levels down. But if we have one heck of a rainstorm like we've had recently, it'll knock a little bit off that flood peak, but it's not gonna knock, it's not gonna stop that flooding from occurring. The more rain we get, the more quickly it gets down to the lake, the quicker the lake fills up. And again, the outlets of those lakes are not efficient drains. So yes, hopefully people are looking at the forecast, the results of their work. Um, they're darned if they do and darned if they don't, but it's only going to ameliorate those water levels by tens of feet, not by, by, by multiple feet. Thank you so much, Bill. Yeah. Uh, this, this is, this is Hillary. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop my share. That's right. Thank you so much. Um, that was pretty spectacular. I, I think, uh, really, really great to, uh, get caught up on that. And we are going to move directly to um, our second speaker, David Wolf, uh, recently of Cornell University, uh, climate change expert and chair of the Cube Lake Watershed Network's board of directors. Take it away, David. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. And you can see my screen slides? Yes. All right, well, great talk, Bill. Um, Really informative as someone who's you know on the on the watershed network board and uh, live living on the lake. Really useful to hear that information. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I think my presentation might be a bit more brief, but I, I really just wanted to put what we heard and, the, and this issue we saw this summer here into context with what we know about how the climate is changing. And um, I think, you know, it's hard for those of us, even those who've lived in the area for a long time, it's, it always seems like anecdotal information. You can't really tell if there's a real trend going on, something that we really should be thinking of, uh, uh, you know, making some serious investments for different kinds of changes, um, or whether, you know, somehow we're going to go back to the new normal. So hopefully my slides will help clarify some of that for you. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you the ending right now. We're not going back to the, the normal, the old normal. That's for sure. We're in a new normal. Um, so, oops. My screen sharing is paused, sorry. Not sure why that happened. I gotta go back to share screen again, sorry. Something happened there, okay. Um, I'm not advancing. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, a graphic from a very recent um, report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which you may know is the international organization involves scientists from um, all around the world, and they periodically put out new reports. So this is one of the most recent ones. And what was really good about this one is in the past, they really focused a lot on providing society with a lot of information on how the global average uh, temperature is changing, um, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but they finally felt at this point in time, we have enough decades now of data to begin digging in more closely into the frequency of extreme events, not just average temperatures, because, uh, you know, living things, the ecosystems and humans and infrastructure does not respond to average uh, climate events, but really to the extremes. And so this is one diagram they, they put together, kind of a diagram, a global diagram uh, uh, 
uh, of the different parts of the world and um, showing the regions where there's really incontrovertible uh, evidence for an increase in heavy rainfall events uh, going back to the 1950s. And uh, first thing is to see, well, green indicates there is an increase. Uh, and you can see most of the world uh, is, is showing that. Many, much of the world is, is showing an increase. And Eastern uh, North America is here. Uh, that's where we are. And we're in that group, of course. What's really striking to me, though, is nowhere in the world since the 1950s, is there any yellow showing there? There is no place where there's a decrease in the uh, frequency of heavy rainfall events. Many places showing an increase. Uh, and now the, the, the gray areas are mostly places where we just don't have sufficient data to really make conclusions. So this is just to say, it's not just us, this is a global phenomenon. Also that the climate scientists uh, certainly saw this coming and it's really pretty intuitive if you think about it. Although when we think about uh, a warming planet, we sometimes tend to think about drought, but also a way to think about it is with a warmer planet, more of the Earth's water is in the air as, as water vapor because of transpiration and evaporation. And uh, therefore, when we do have a rain event, there's much more to come down and it comes down, you know, in, in a deluge often. And so that's kind of um, the story where we're, where we're at today. So it is global and we'll quickly come down soon to uh, local. I wanna show you a, a little cartoon, excuse my little cloud cartoons here, but just to make sure everybody kind of gets this point really in a very simplistic um, way, I wanna show how climate change is really, as one put it, person put it, one climate scientist put it, it's putting uh, our hydrological system on steroids. So this is kind of our, let's say our, our former hydrological cycle and we have uh, you know, incoming energy, um, uh, driving transpiration and evaporation water loss. It goes up into the air as water vapor. Sometimes it forms into clouds. It may come down as rain in that same place where it went up, or it may not come down where it went up. It might move. The clouds might move and come down elsewhere. Um, but there you have it. That can move around a little bit. What goes up comes down eventually somewhere. And uh, there you have it. But add warming uh, so we have the rainfall. And so the upper atmosphere cooling events, water vapor condenses into rain. Here's kind of a depiction now showing what's happening with, um, with um, our global warming. Just more transpiration, more evaporation, not just because it's warmer, but also complicated things such as our lakes um, are often uh, have fewer days of snow cover in the higher elevation, higher uh, latitude areas. And uh, ice, fewer days of ice cover means more potential for uh, evaporation from them. So particularly in the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere, we're seeing more, more water going into the air as water vapor. And a well-known aspect of physics is that warmer air can also hold more water. So we have these big, big clouds holding lots of water vapor. Now, if that big cloud doesn't release some of that water where it went up, at the same time, we can also have more drought because with warmer temperatures and more transpiration from our, from our soils due to vegetation um, and, and just evaporation and evaporation of the lakes, we could have more soil water deficits in our, in our soil areas and leading to more short-term droughts, which is why we have a world now where there's an increased frequency of both droughts and, and flooding. In our area, it's the, it's the uh, flooding and excess of rains, that's, that's the big story. So when this comes down, it comes down with a lot more energy, a lot more water, um, and so we have these pretty significant storms. So it's, it's, it's kind of based on basic physics and hydrology that this phenomenon is happening. And of all the aspects of climate change that, uh, that are out there, there's you know, potential for increased frequency of drought, summer heat stress days, et cetera, et cetera, warmer winters. Um, the one that is manifested in our region most, in a most pronounced way, is this increased frequency of heavy rainfall. You can see in the US, we are the real winner, if you wanna call it that, in terms of the frequency of days per year where we're seeing high rainfall events. And in our region, that's uh, determined as uh, two, greater than two inches in 24 hours. So going back to the lake flooding, uh, two inches in 24 hours, you can calculate that would be, you know what, two feet of uh, lake level rise in 24 hours. That's what we call an extreme rainfall event. So this isn't saying there's 70% more rain, uh, annual rainfall in our area, but saying that we're having a 70% increase 
in the frequency of high rainfall events. So we're, we really stand out, even though this is being seen across the, across the globe, uh, this is the very real problem for us. And it's a trend that has been going on for the, since the middle of the century, really kind of picked up steam in the um, uh, latter half of the 20th century. Here's, here's data now specifically for New York. And this goes back all the way to 1870. I do want to specify that looking at this graphic, each of these bars represents the ten, a 10 year decadal average to create, you know, a little easier to read the graph. And basically you can see, you know, before 1950 or so, going back to the 1800s, uh, you know, we were somewhere here in terms of our number of days per year with this kind of extreme rain. And now we're somewhere over here and in fact, it's quite clearly going up exponentially with no real evidence that it's going to be slowing down any time in sight. So in terms of, um, you know, if you were hoping for things to go back to normal, I think this kind of, um, uh, I wouldn't bet on that one anyway. So just putting that in perspective that it really is a, a problem for us, something we have to think about seriously. And so given the, the story that Bill was talking about, you know, so much of this in our watershed ends up in the lake um, and, and then we have also a lot of complications in terms of trying to control the lake level. This is what we had. These are just some photos of the top ones, uh, pictures I took actually this last uh, fall. Um, you can see serious damage in terms of, first of all, this was a little culvert outlet near my home that usually is like a little trickle of a waterfall, even on a rainy day. Um, and it was just gushing out like that. Um, this is a neighbor, their property they had, the sidewalk was a little beat up, I would say, before the flood event, just a few days of flooding, and this is what happened to that, that sidewalk. They're pretty, they're going to have to do a major, you know, reconstruction job. And then we have entire docks um, just completely destroyed. One thing, you know, I really noticed being on the lake and clearing up the mess down at our shoreline, also just a lot of floating debris, dangerous debris in the lake. So really quite dangerous. We had to pull out some things that were literally pilings, I think, from other docks and whole upper parts of docks. So um, serious damage and there's a cost to all of that. Um, so, you know, we have to, uh, there, there are those who are vulnerable and, and those who are less vulnerable to every type of way that climate change is impacting us. This particular case, it's, it's people who actually live on the lake and have property on the lake and have docks on the lake. Um, and um, yes, we can adapt to this as Bill's information provided us, we can't really count on you know, a totally optimum lake level control at any time soon to save us from this. And uh, so we're gonna have to adapt, which means people are gonna have to spend money to build back this destroyed infrastructure and it really would be a mistake at this juncture to be building back uh, the kind of docks that maybe we could get away with on Cayuga Lake in the past. A lot of people have docks where really the, uh, the surface of the dock is really basically can, can end up floating on the water if, if the water levels get high. Docks without any pilings. We can have docks with pilings, but they're just sort of resting on the, on the surface of the water. This, this dock here has, has cement underneath, weighing it down so even uh, with pretty extreme flooding, that, that dock's not going anywhere. And then we have our shoreline, shoreline issues too and destruction. Um, and there's a lot of questions about how to build back better. Um, do we need to leave our shorelines a little less hard, as they say, uh, less hard sh shorelines, make them more flexible knowing that we are gonna have these flooding events or do we you know, build giant walls to protect our shorelines or do we do something in between like here, which is hopefully gonna minimize uh, the damage to this, this landscape. Um, but of course, people in the living, living along the lake uh, tend to be people who have, probably have the funds to afford this sort of thing. But this gets into the issue of climate change, which I'll bring up at the end of my, uh, my presentation, is that there's, there's a couple of things that have to do with um, you know, vulnerability to climate change. One is just the luck of the draw of where you are, where your property is. In this case, if you're living on the lake, obviously you're gonna be more prone to having this kind of issue. But the other is the capacity to adapt. And often that involves you know, actually having capital to spend on this. Um, and we have to think about that in terms of the impacts on urban centers. And for example, there's flooding zones in many of our cities and often it's the poorest who live in some of those flooded, flood-prone areas of, of our towns with the least ability 
to adapt. So um, we have to think a lot about that as well. But we need to build back better. We talked to, uh, same thing, a very different story with uh, heat stress. We have increasing summer heat stress. This is very bad for dairy cows and milk production. And we talked to dairy farmers, if it's time to put up a new dairy barn, you don't want to put up a dairy barn built on the heat specs of yesteryear. You have to have better cooling capacity. Putting up new structures here for the shoreline, we have to be prepared for more of these flooding events. So that's kind of the infrastructure impact, but there's also an ecological impact of these high rainfall events. And this really gets into throughout the whole watershed, this rainfall is coming down, leading to lots of soil erosion, nutrient and chemical runoff, coming from everything from asphalt and parking lots to farms and home landscapes. And all of this is going into the lake. And I think many here on this call are well aware for in the Finger Lakes, well aware of our recently emerging more severe harmful algal bloom prob problem. And certainly some of this is attributed to increased nutrient loading uh, in our lakes. So this is another aspect to the impact of um, these high rainfall events um, on our lake and on our, on our community and our ecosystems. This one is not amenable to, gets away from the lake level control issue is gonna happen in, in any case. So it's what can we do upstream for some of these things. In our, uh, in our CategoryLake.org website, we have a new section on climate change and we talk about some of these problems, sort of the bad news, but we have a whole section on what we can do about it. And in there, you can see some short PowerPoints at our website on, on things uh, such as these, um, protecting our stream banks as much as possible, both at the homeowner level. Uh, this is uh, some soil water conservation district staff doing this um, at the more uh, larger landscape scale. But do, thinking, doing things to uh, create buffers between the landscape uh, where there might be a lot of erosion, chemical runoff, and our waterways that eventually get into the lake is a very important move to help buffer us, uh, in this case, from the, um, the pollution problem uh, to the lake. But also can, these buffers can also, you know, increase the holding capacity. And, and uh, uh, coming back to something Bill was mentioning about how rapidly the water is getting into the lake with all of our infrastructure, uh, slow the pace at which a heavy rainfall event reaches the lake. So it's not all coming, coming at once. So, some things we, we can all be doing. Um, farmers have you know, their own issues, of course, with these heavy rainfall events. Um, many farmers are you know, encouraged about the news that one of the, you might say a silver lining from a farmer or even a gardener's perspective of climate change in our area is a trend for a longer frost-free period with our warmer temperatures. It means you can plant earlier, right? Well, what the farmers are finding is we're seeing um, an increase in spring rains that is often delaying planting. So while we're having a earlier spring in terms of temperatures, they can't get in to plant their annual row crops. Um, of course, there could be flooding of, of uh, row crops during the growing season, which can wipe out a crop. Uh, and But then relevant to the ecological impact I was talking about before, of course, farmers are often using uh, chemicals, manures, and so um, runoff from these farms is not just putting sediment into our waterways from soil erosion, but also chemicals and uh, nutrients into our waterways. So uh, a lot of work, a lot of farmers are, there's incentives, the, the state uh, through the, uh, our, our Ag and Markets Group and the Soil Water Conservation Districts, and at the national level, the NRCS, the USDA NRCS, has lots of incentive programs to begin doing things in terms of better managing their farms and lands to minimize this sort of thing. And there's, there's just a tremendous amount of activity, actually very positive going on. Um, sometimes when I get sort of down in the mouth about climate change, um, you know, one advantage I have in terms of the people I work with is I just see a lot of people who are working on solutions, uh, including many farmers and other, other landowners. Um, Another aspect of farming is just inter-row ground covers. When I first moved to this area oh, over 30 years ago, um, a lot of our grape growers uh, were, didn't really have a ground cover between their, between their, 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 um, their rows. And uh, for a variety of reasons they've done that. First of all, it's better access for them when the, when the field is muddy, et cetera, their own 
personal reasons, but also, of course, it, it reduces erosion of their, no farmer wants to see their soil being washed into gullies. Um, and also, though, uh, this, this dramatic increase in inter-row ground cover in our vineyards is doing a lot to protect um, our waterways. And for our annual row crop growers, um, fall and winter cover crops is becoming uh, more and more widely used. And uh, part of this is to help build up organic matter in the soil, which they know is good for their own bottom line, maintaining their soils to be very productive. But when you have a cover crop out there in the fall and winter, uh, which is actually when we're getting some of our uh, most rainfall, and most of this, a lot of this high uh, frequency of uh, heavy rains is coming in those months, um, can really um, buffer the soil from that and, um, and, and protect some of that from getting into our waterways. So very important, a lot of things going on in terms of that stuff. So in our uh, urban and rural areas, there's also just tremendous, you know, can be in, uh, tremendous infrastructure damage that we're seeing more and more frequently. Um, there's many municipalities, uh, certainly around this nation that I'm aware of, you know, go to give talks in places where they are seriously making major investments. I mean, raising taxes to local taxpayers to improve their storm drainage systems. Or certainly when it's time to um, uh, renovate or you know, uh, modernize their, their, their storm drainage systems, they're not just putting in the same size of storm drains as they did in the past and rethinking these things to, to uh, deal with this. There's also things like semi-permeable asphalt that can be used that then soaks some of that rainfall in instead of it washing into waterways and creating flooding. Uh, this is a map of uh, the flood region of uh, Ithaca, New York, and as I, this is a kind of a, basically a floodplain area. And um, so the homeowners here, of course, are particularly vulnerable. And within that, and within those those homeowners, again coming back to the, the climate justice issues, there are some who can better afford to maybe get flood insurance or think about uh, better protecting their home uh, than others. And so, comes back to that that story of. Um, you know, who has the capacity to make some adaptation uh, to these things. Again, at our website, we talk a little bit about what homeowners can do about this particular issue of flooding risk. And I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but there are certainly things to be done. Um, and it's more than waiting for, you know, a, a basement to come become completely flooded, but there can be simply chronic uh, uh, damp spots around the, the foundation of the home that eventually can cause fairly serious damage. So a lot of things to be done there. Uh, improving the storm drainage around the home uh, at quite a quite an expense and creates you know, obviously requires some real professional advice. Is bringing you know creating real water barriers around basements and other low lying spaces. But again, none of these adaptations to climate change. It's it's the cost of living today in a warming world, and uh, none of these are free. And uh, not everybody can afford them equally. And um, so it's, it's uh, kind of where we're at. We have to think about these things and ways also of, um, you know, evening out the, the, these costs sometimes to, to different people. This is kind of a, as I've mentioned climate change a couple of times, and I really just have a couple of slides left here. Um, this is kind of just excerpted from a nice short article, which I cite here from um, the Yale Climate Group on what, what do we mean by climate justice? And I'll go through that a little bit because it's something that our organization, the Coyote Lake Watershed Network is thinking about in addition to perhaps simply, you know, working with our members and with uh, municipalities and uh, other uh, agencies, government agencies to do things such as um, uh, protecting riparian zones, et cetera, but also working on this, this issue. So what climate justice is really about is that no one's immune to climate change, first of all. I mean, the rich and the poor, everybody can get, is going to get hit one way or another. But the impacts are not going to be borne equally or fairly across regions, farms, communities, and individuals. So I think we all are quite aware of that. Often also, often the least responsible for the emissions of greenhouse gases leading to this climate change are, uh, the ones least responsible are those that are most, most vulnerable. This particularly gets into really kind of a global perspective of the North versus South. Many of the developing nations, um, uh, you know, they have less um, capacity for adapting, and yet they are much less responsible. So a lot of differences in capacity to adapt. It's not just, um, you know, where you're living, the luck of the draw, whether you're in a vulnerable place, 
Uh, you could move somewhere else and be, you may not be vulnerable to extreme rain, but it, it, uh, more vulnerable to extreme drought. We all get hit with something, but it's the capacity to adapt. And there's a lot of differences between rich and poor, men and women, older and younger generations, the healthy and those with chronic health conditions. So those are another issues. Turns out the poor are often living in homes, more exposed to flooding risk, also more exposed to overheating and poor uh, cooling systems and poor energy efficiency. Um, the poor are more vulnerable to rising food prices that may occur with impacts on agriculture. And also those who have to work outside, going from farmers to construction workers, uh, people who have to drive on our roads routinely, um, whether it's more rain or more snow, uh, those whose livelihood is directly impacted by climate change of the weather or work primarily outside are also among the more vulnerable. So um, as I get, so, so that's something that our organization's really working on. Okay, this slide I'm kind of just finalizing here and I'm not gonna go through the details of this slide. I'm really just, this slide, the only point of this slide is to remind you that I'm in my little short talk here, I'm only talking one little aspect of, well, an important one, but one of the aspects of the way climate change is being manifest in our region. All of these are other examples. And I could go through the same kind of presentation, but talk about uh, summer heat stress, warmer winters, um, longer frost feed period, changing seasonal patterns, short-term summer droughts. All of those things are happening in our area. And all of these have their own set of impacts on infrastructure, effects on the biology and ecology of where we live, including actually the human health in some cases for some of these, such as summer heat stress, and socioeconomic and climate justice issues. So um, there's a lot more to be discussed. And some of this is covered at our, at our website, but certainly not all of this. And, um, just urge you to become aware of all of these issues, particularly those that are affecting our area of which this is, there's evidence for all of these um, in our region. Uh, this is just kind of a screenshot of our, our website. You can click two areas that really, the signs of climate change section really shows a lot of the data about things like I've showed you, the increased frequency of high rainfall events, some of that data documenting the evidence that something is happening here. It's not just your personal observations that may or may not be correct. And then there's a whole big section about what we can do about it. And then finally, we do have a, a section of other resources, you know, documents uh, such as uh, one put together by one of our board members and a summer intern, Lakeside Living in a Changing Climate. We have a number of things along those lines, um, but things from other organizations as well as links to other, uh, other groups and other websites that are very relevant to our particular region. So I urge you to take a look at that. And um, I think that's it. That's my dog, Luna, sitting on the dock, wondering, questioning what's gonna happen next. <laughs> I'll take uh, questions if we have some. And we could actually go back if we have time to some of Bill's questions if need be. Thanks, David. Um, that was uh, wonderful as uh, commentary and also to uh, let folks know um, something about the changes coming and that we, we uh, somehow not have to need to figure out how to uh, handle it. Yeah. Um, are there, are there any, are there any questions? I, I see several compliments, David. Okay, I'm going to stop share, I think at this point. Okay, that's a beautiful doggy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jen, uh, do, do you want to I don't, I don't, I don't really see any questions, just praise, which is very good. Oh, well, I'll, I'll take that, I guess. At least there's no, uh, yeah, that's better than sometimes when I do talks on climate change, I get, I get some pretty, pretty wild comments that aren't so pleasant. So I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, well, we still have lots of folks out there. So everyone, please feel free. This is the time to, uh, to, you know, ask questions. You've got these experts right here. Um, yeah, I can go back to some of Bill's questions. I'm totally fine with that because I think that was the main event here. And I was putting this just into context about the reality that um, don't expect the problems of Lake to go away anytime soon without uh, us doing something about it. Right, or, or, or right. adapting to it. I guess that's my attitude. But we've got For a sure. question from Doug A there, Jen. Oh, well, I was going to go back up. Um, okay. um, yep. So let me just ask this earlier one and then we'll, we'll skip ahead um, to, uh, well, you know what? Never mind. 
let's do this. We'll, we'll, we'll do the, the most recent first. Okay, sorry. Um, um, in the short, sorry, this is, uh, they're coming in as I'm trying to read. Uh, in the short term, are there any suggestions for action for owners along the lake? So kind of practical, what can we do right now if there's an issue? Well, um, for those along the lake, I would say, you know, as I, I obviously, like I was saying, I think you need to re-examine re uh, the, the sturdiness of your docks and, and think about that. If it's time to maybe uh, renovate the dock, take into, uh, into, into your thoughts, uh, the height of the dock and, and how, how steady it is if the water level comes up over the dock, that kind of thing, what, what, it, what that involves. Um, uh, you know, putting up, to the extent you're concerned about your, your lake shore disappearing and eroding, um, deciding what you want to do about uh, that, that some protection there. So the things, I think uh, those of us who live on the lake, we have a special responsibility, of course, in terms of thinking about buffering our, you know, which would be very rapid uh, input from things that are running off from our, our landscapes of the lake. So we want to be very careful about that, have some buffers so maybe more of that gets absorbed. And of course, there's also the issue of septic systems on the lake shore, that kind of thing. Um, but even for those upland um, in the watershed, um, as I said, I think everybody can be doing things to think about where their stormwater goes um, and uh, other things they can do to, if they see that running directly into ditches, culverts, and creeks that get into our waterways, uh, that's, that's an important thing to be considering. And if there are, then I mentioned also some things about um, homeowners thinking about uh, building resilience in their homes. Some of that stuff, as I say, is at our website on uh, what can we do about it section. Yes, and I will plug also, there is information on our Lake Friendly Living section of our website as well about what homeowners of all areas can do uh, to improve um, the water quality. So definitely take a look at all of the resources we have on our website. Yeah, yeah I think I saw a question, yeah, about what was the book that I was in the, near the end. Um, it might've been the Lakeside Living in a, in a Changing Climate one that was what they were referring to. And we also have one that's kind of expanded. I think it's Watershed Living in a Changing Climate. It talks, it includes more stuff for the uplanders. Mm -hmm. And we have, um, yeah, other things there as well. Great, another question that came in, David, going back to the Cayuga Inlet level data, um, it seems like there have been heroic efforts to manage the lake levels in recent years in light of the dramatic increase in heavy precipitation events, or am I missing something? This is for Bill, right? I, I think it's back to going back to Bill. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, run that past me again. Sure, yep, go, yep. So the comment in question is going back to the Cayuga Inlet level data. It seems like there have been heroic efforts to manage the lake levels in recent years in light of the dramatic increase in heavy precipitation events, or am I missing something? I'm not too sure what uh, the, the, the person was getting at as far as managing uh, things. Were they talking locally or were they talking the outlet of the lake or something like that? But um, yes, I think it's be people have become more aware of these concerns. <clears throat> the Barge Canal Corporation has always stood by and said that uh, these lakes were not, the water, le water level management was not set up to do flood control, but they have tried to incorporate that into where they can, how they can to try to take care of, you know, again, looking at a forecast and saying, it looks like it's gonna get some heavy rain. Maybe we'll try dropping the water level a little bit now and try to you know, make the less. Uh, there have been a lot of things though that have been going in the other direction uh, as far as getting water directly to the lake. Now, how to correct for that is difficult. I mean, you can try to you know, put like little detention basins along roadways to try to hold back some of that water. But when you have a big rainstorm, they all get filled up and basically the water just comes rolling down the hillside. Trying to divert that water to try to hold the water back might be possible, but in certain areas in other areas, it would not be possible. Uh, David had brought up permeable pavement instead of having asphalt pavement that covers acres and acres and acres. Uh, if 
the substrate material can absorb some of that water, it would be a good idea. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. There's a lot of things that maybe people have tried. Uh, it, it's a moving target. And the target is basically telling us that we're gonna see more and more in the way of flooding. So there's more of a need for people to try to figure out what they can do to try to uh, reduce those effects. Uh, I've, I've got one quote, cute story about uh, what people can do who live along the lake, uh, live up in Trumansburg and a lady approached me uh, sometime in the early nineties saying they had just bought some property uh, right along the lake and they wanted me to look at it to advise what they could do and where they should do things. We want walk down, they bought property that had a tributary stream that was flowing down the hillside and right behind where they were going to build their house, the stream took a jog to, I think it was the south along the hillside and then to the, to the, to the lake. And she said, this is the place. And I looked at it and I said, have you ever been down to the Jersey Shore? And have you seen houses that are put up on pilings? And she said, yeah, why? I said, because... If you get a major event and your house is built on the ground level, when you get a major storm, that creek's not going to take that turn. It's going to go right into your house. And so she said, oh, OK, thank you very much. After the 96 flood, walking down the street, this lady came running up to me, didn't recognize her, gave me a big hug and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, OK, what are you thanking me for? Well, I talked it over with my husband and he saw what you were talking about. So they, they put their house up on stilts. I think they were like maybe four or five feet high. And they put the kids' bikes underneath and they put their canoe underneath and things like that. She said when the storm came, it did just like you said, it went right underneath the house. The fish are using the bikes and we had to go out and get the canoe out of the lake. But our house is fine. So here, this is an extreme case where they were building something new, but people need to think about this when they have their houses. We're going to see this more and more. A long time ago, folks basically had shacks along the lake, and they were enjoyable. If it flooded, okay, they went in and they cleaned the mud out and everything else, and then they enjoyed their houses. Now people are moving down there, putting in very nice houses but putting them in places where they shouldn't put them, not putting them up high enough to get above the flood plain, and uh, things like septic systems. If your septic system is gonna get flooded, you're gonna end up getting all those nutrients into the lake. So there's a lot of things that people need to consider. One of my talks was up at the Northern end of uh, Seneca Lake, and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I, I learned from your talk. We've always had flooding that came off this tributary and it just dumped all the sediment onto our property. And I get a guy to come in with a rake and he'd rake it all up and we'd remove it. And the next storm would do the same thing. Well, I got smart. I took all that material and built a berm. And so the storms that came down afterwards were routed to the lake and very little came onto his lawn. Again, you have to consider where you live and the impacts that may impact your, your home, your property. And you have to consider those things. And you know, for a lot of people, it may be too expensive to do, but you need to think about it and start to do the small things to reduce the impact of flooding on your property is what it boils down to. So again, it's a personal thing. It's not you know, big brother. It's not uh, blaming the barge canal because they, they got flooded. There's only so much they can do. And so based upon that, or based upon a watershed where they, they've controlled the water level as best they can, don't blame them. You gotta blame yourself and you've gotta do what you can do to try to reduce that impact. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Um, Jeff, you and we'll turn it back to climate change now, David. Um, so a question that came in says, are the climate change issues solely limited to the Cayuga Lake watershed and the central New York region? Are there drought concerns likely in the reasonable future? 
or does the evidence show more likely flood concerns? Oh, that's a good question. I had thought about talking about drought in this presentation as well, but I thought let's just keep it straightforward. This make a whole thing about the flood risk. But um, interestingly, and perhaps not, you know, it's, it's kind of a little, little complicated to explain how we actually have an increased risk of short-term summer droughts with climate change in our area, as well as this increased risk of flooding. And the reason for that has to do not so much with the, you know, this, uh, we've been focusing mostly on when it does rain, it pours, the frequency of these really heavy extreme rains, but just the, the, uh, the recent historical and the projected future differences in the different seasons of the year uh, and, the, and the annual rainfall in different seasons of the year. So um, overall, uh, our annual rainfall uh, in uh, New York State um, has been going up slightly the last 30, 40 years, but I'm very modestly, you know, uh, uh, maybe 5% or so. Um, and most of that, however, is not coming in the summer. It's coming in all the other months except for the summer. And then the latest model projections for what's going to be happening to seasonal rainfall as we move forward uh, into the, the projection I'm thinking of, the, the map I might have showed you would, was going to be showing you the four seasons of the year and uh, the period 2040 to 2070. And what that shows is um, summer rainfall changing very little, about the same as we have today. That's, in some ways, that's good news compared to some areas of the world, uh, such as the Western US, where their projections would show rainfall going way down. So our rainfalls are gonna stay about the same, uh, but much wetter in, uh, particularly in fall and spring and winter, uh, particularly winter. But the other three months, some uh, definitely getting, you know, uh, increased uh, rainfall. Uh, so the problem is, though, in the summer when we're trying to grow crops or growing vegetables in the garden or whatever, um, if we have the same amount of rainfall, but we have a we have warmer summer temperatures and we have a longer period in which the plants are actively growing because their spring is coming earlier and fall is coming later, a longer growing season plus warmer temperatures, they're going to demand more water. So if we don't have an, because we're not gonna have an increase in rainfall sufficient to keep up with the increased demand with climate change, we are likely to have an increased risk of short-term summer, summer droughts. I'm talking about a few weeks here and there, four or five weeks. This is the kind of thing, uh, maybe the home gardener can get away with not worrying too much about that. But for farmers who are doing high value crops, uh, some of them, for example, fruits and vegetables, they may have, enough irrigation equipment to cover a part of their acreage. And in the future, they may have to invest in equipment to cover more of their acreage because otherwise they don't have enough time to get around in these sort of these, these areas. In 2016, we had a real record breaking drought. Some of you may know about, uh, especially any of you who are involved in farming, central New York and Western New York, uh, millions of dollars lost to farmers due to a very severe drought. So that kind of thing is gonna be happening a little more often in the summer. So we're gonna have both more, uh, uh, risk of short-term summer droughts and also more risk of flooding. I would say the risk of flooding is more rampant, more uh, broad, but uh, we're not going to get away. Uh, people who are, for example, farmers in this area are going to have more summer droughts than they ever saw before. So they're going to have to be prepared. And that also means people who live on, uh, people who are not farmers but have uh, shallow wells or rely on creek water for some reason or other, um, you know, they could have more problems in the future as we go towards the middle of the century, et cetera, so. Sorry, there we go, I muted myself. Uh, next question that came in is about dairy farms. And it asks, it appears to me that some of the mega dairy farm manure practices and spreading is feeding our creeks more than ever. Would you like to comment? Okay, well, um, I'll tell you what I know about that. I don't work a lot with the dairy industry, but I have uh, my, my years at Cornell, I worked a lot with faculty who work with them, and I do work with the Water Conservation District people who work with them. So um, the larger dairy operations, I believe the, some of you probably know better than me, I think it's 300 cows. Uh, you get to that size farm operation or bigger, uh, they do have to follow uh, a whole series of uh, DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, regulations. They have to come up with 
with management plans for their manure applications and all of that. So they're, they're sort of being, you know, uh, there's, um, there's, there's regulations. Um, are they as strict as some people might want them to be? Um, that's another question, but they are being, you know, monitored. They do have to put together these plans. So there's work on that. And I think with um, the things we talked about today, the increased frequency of high rainfall events, some of what the, the government agencies that work with these dairy farmers on manure management and on their land management, um, they are you know, rethinking what the guidelines should be for people with dairy who are using, applying a lot of manure to their, to their farm. So that's being you know, reevaluated appropriately so. Um, a lot of the smaller dairy farms, you know, there's not the DEC kind of you know, really watching over carefully what they're doing. And um, uh, we've got farmers who are trying to do the right thing and some who try to get away with whatever they might get away with. So um, th that's what's going on. Yeah, I'd like to add on to what David just said. Um, when you get to these large uh, farms within the Kuga Lake watershed, we have several that have like 3000 cows. Um, they basically milk those cows three times a day. So they're feeding them water with a little bit of salt in it. So they drink more water so they can make more milk. A lot of times they burn the cows out. Uh, but basically the days of cow pies is gone. What you're left with is liquid manure and a lot of it because they're running water through them. They're feeding a lot and they're making milk. So the farmers are having a tougher time with the liquid manure applying it. And so they are going far out away from their farms to other locations to apply the manure on those, uh, on those fields to basically take care of uh, the manure. They have these large storage capacities. Some of the large farms actually uh, generate electricity from the uh, decomposition of the manure, uh, you know, methane coming off and things like that. But there's a lot more manure to be spread on the fields. And how it's spread, a lot of times it's sprayed. And if it rains right after, or if it's on frozen ground and, it, and you have snow melt, you run into a lot of manure getting into creeks and then finding its way down to the lakes. Um, there is a lot of uh, the CAFOs, confined area feedlot operations, basically have different sets of rules. They have to incorporate they have to uh, not spread in certain areas to try to eliminate the amount that would get into a stream and, and so on. So uh, there's a lot manure, more manure to be taken care of. There are more rules for these uh, industrial milking operations and they are moving further afield to try to get rid of that manure so they can continue doing the operations uh, the way they do. So. Uh, there are pluses and minuses. It depends on whether you drink milk or not, but there's also a tremendous amount of waste that needs to be handled and proper handling of that. Uh, there are rules and regulations and there are fines if they don't do it right. So uh, the big concern is these large operations have a lot of manure to be basically be handled and to be properly applied to fields incorporated so they can use less uh, man-made fertilizer, but at the same time, they have to do it right and they have to do it so it, it's not gonna rain two inches the next day and then move that material down to the lakes. Okay, great. Thank you both for answering that question so, so thoroughly. Um, so the next question, I'm not sure if you, either of you know the answer to this or if you have a resource that you could send folks to. But the question is about building heights um, and says, given the precipitation changes and recognizing we all need to elevate our structures to avoid structure damage from flooding, how high should we be building things? Um, and gives a, a relevance of the 1993 flood plus a foot or plus two feet. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, where's your house? What is, what part of your house is going to be flooded? With that in mind, raise it up and 
add maybe a foot or uh, two feet to that. If you live like uh, that, this, that one uh, story I told, if you live where you got a tributary coming down the hill, you better build it higher because you don't know how high the water's gonna get. And as was discussed earlier, there's a lot of debris that gets into the lake and that debris comes off of these steep slopes and you can get a natural dam on a, on a uh, tributary and it's gonna back up the water and then it's gonna flood in places that you wouldn't think it would go. I guess the bottom line is determine where your, what your base level of your house is, determine where the major flood level is and get it above at least that. The 100 year flood, you could see that there was the 72 flood and the 93 flood in that period from the 50s to uh, the present day. So that's roughly 70 years. So you, we've had two of those. Will we get other major floods? I'm pretty sure we will. So you have to make that determination. It, 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 it's not a simple recipe. Two feet will do it, three feet is better. It all depends where you are, what your house elevation, floor elevation is now, and what, you, what level do you want it to be above so that your house will be safe. People also on the lake have been talking about, you know, building, uh, you know, having their raising docks a little higher, but of course there's a, a uh, complication there is that, you know, most of those folks also are boat owners and getting in and out of a, uh, a boat if the dock is, is really high is a problem. There can be, I guess, some ways of, uh, you know, designing a, a dock so it has a ledge that allows you to get in and out of boats and stuff. But yeah, that's, that's a, a problem. Another thing is having a dock that can actually can withstand being actually submerged for a short period of time and still, still stand. <laughs> There's, a, there's another way too. My son lives on the West Coast, lives outside of Portland. And I've been on the Willamette River. And the Willamette River, when it floods just about every year, it floods 10 to 20 feet high. So all the docks that are along the Willamette River in Portland have pilings that are about 20 feet high. They all float and they all have like U-clamps that go around the pilings. So as the water level goes up, the dock goes up. As the water level goes down, the dock goes down. But it doesn't float away because it's hooked on with the hooks. Yeah, I see, yeah. Right, so uh, people may want to consider that. Obviously, they don't need you know, pilings that are 20 feet up in the air. But having a dock that floats may be better than a dock that uh, is secured, even cement. It gets flooded. It may be damaged. So uh, floating docks, uh, not necessarily a prescription, but it's something to think about. Great. Okay, well, as a network organization, I like this next question, uh, which is how well do the various organization, organizations that control the lake and river levels work together? And is there any overarching organization? Oh, this goes back to when myself and Betsy Landry wrote the original report from which this talk came from, which was in 2000. There was some severe flooding in the late 90s. And there was supposed to be a regional commission that was designated by the New York State government at that exact agency. It never occurred. This would be something that I think would be really important, would be to have a state mandated and have representatives from all the lakes, from all the different uh, organizations be present at and coordinate in a fashion that we know that they're all trying to help each other versus we're gonna take care of ourselves and the heck with you folks downstream. Um, I think there is some coordination, but there is not an organization. And again, this was something that was proposed well over 20 years ago. I read someplace, and I can't remember where, it was actually formed, but they never had a meeting. So this is something that maybe the network can get together with the other lake associations and put the pedal to the metal and try to get this organization established and operating. Good. 
Um, we're just going to take two more questions tonight. And again, just keep in mind, please, that if we didn't get to your question or somehow overlooked it, we apologize. We are going to download the full chat and make sure that anything we may have missed um, will be addressed in writing. Um, we'll send we'll send that out to you folks after um, after this is completed. Uh, the next question, though, is in a drought, how much water can farmers withdraw from the lakes and the canal? Um, yes, there are some limits on uh, Great Lakes water withdrawals. I think that also up to the canals. Um, not sure about that, but I know um, Great Lakes water. Great Lakes water is because it involves. It's actually like an international international waters. There's there's constraints on that. And they have to. Um, uh, also uh, provide information on how much they are they are using. So I don't know the details of that. There are some guidelines for that. Again, it's the Department of Environmental Conservation who runs that. And I used to be more on top of what, what that's about. Um, there isn't, uh, unlike, you know, I, I uh, <clears throat> grew up in my younger professional days while I was still in grad school in California. I worked a lot with water there. And it's in New York State, it's nothing like the water story for farmers in the West, where um, farmers know exactly how much they're drawing, and, and so do the government agencies, and it's it's kept very well track of. Here, it's it's a little bit kind of wild west in terms of most. A lot of farmers are really getting their water uh, from things like uh, uh, pumps pumping out of small creeks going through their property or wells and things like that. And uh, there's no real monitoring of, of, of that sort of thing. So um, there is, I was on a, a panel um, a couple of years ago um, called Reimagining the Erie Canal System. And uh, it was a statewide group of people from different places. And um, there was discussion about using um, water from the canal that is kind of you know, not, not much of it's being used now for transporting boats and that it could work as an irrigation source for farmers, particularly in the uh, western part of the state, like from Buffalo to Syracuse, that region, having uh, uh, allowance of farmers to withdraw water from there. So I don't know where that stands now. Was, there's going to be the idea would be developing kind of like a real water district that would manage that. Yeah, I think the DEC has uh, permitting for withdrawals of 100,000 gallons. Uh, I don't think it's a day, but maybe it is. Uh, and I think the Barge Canal Corporation permits withdrawals, but that doesn't mean that somebody can't throw a hose in and then withdraw some water. As far as yeah. from the lakes, um, I don't know. Uh, like, like David said, it's it's not really something that uh, the DEC manages unless it's a large volume of water. And Barge Canal for yeah. certain growers, I think, does permit uh, yeah. large withdrawals, but not for small ones. Yeah. And we don't really have a good plan for, you know, and going back to the drought story, a, a statewide plan for serious, serious drought emergencies, which uh, if 2016 was any indication of more of that kind of thing to come, we may need to do something about that because, um, you know, uh, there is a, uh, there are some rules that certainly the uh, drinking water, you know, has highest priority. But other than that, it's a little bit, uh, it, it can, it's a little messy in terms of where, you know, the, the hierarchy of who gets water in a, in, in a real shortage situation. We're going to have to uh, wrap it up here. Um, our time is coming to a close. Bill Kleepak, uh, we promise we'll get a good answer to you for your question. Um, and I want to thank everybody so much uh, and to our two wonderful, amazing speakers. And um, remind everyone that the, this entire wonderful session will be available at the Kugel Lake Watershed Network's YouTube channel. And Jen will um, send you uh, the link information for that as soon as it's available there. Thanks so much from everybody at the Kugel Lake Watershed Network. And thanks, Bill.
And thanks, Dave. Too. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.